All right. Good morning, Doug. Uh, we have a couple of interesting things to talk about today. And one is more uh, like I have a, a philosophical investment question and, you know, I, about alternative assets in particular. The investing climate today is one where it seems like there's all kinds of risk. And, you know, normally the way that someone thinks about how to handle that risk is like, well, you know, you have to have some exposure to alternative assets. But I don't even know what that means. Like, what is an alternative asset actually? Yeah, that's a very good question. So <clears throat> I'm not even sure this has been well defined. And if it has been defined, it's been by a conventional financial thinker, like somebody with one of those phony up degrees, like certified financial planner or something like that. Certainly, kind of certainly at least an, an MBA, at least. Yeah, kind of guy that would tell you to buy a, a front end loaded mutual fund. Right. That kind of would come up yeah. with the answer to this. So taking a shot at this, <clears throat> maybe we can divide assets into two classes, financial and tangible. Mm -hmm. And conventional financial assets are all financial. They're all electronic today. I mean, you can't even hold a stock certificate anymore today, not of a publicly traded company. I mean, I guess you can, but they resist giving them to you so much that you can practically forget about it. Mm. But so, um, and of course, this is one of the problems with the world, everything being so financialized, it's become a daisy chain based on a huge amount of debt, which could bring down all these financial institutions and the dollar itself could be brought down. I mean, uh, the conventional assets, financial assets, are, are, are looking at a potential. I hate to be so gloom and doomy. It's just that, it, it's just that, and I hate to use the word sustainable or unsustainable. <laughs> but sometimes you have to be gloomy and use the word sustainable because it's the best word. Yeah, both. <laughs> That's right. And both of them, both of these things have been corrupted because if you're gloom and doomy, <clears throat> then you're a negative Nelly that everybody makes fun of for having missed the great stock market boom. And, uh, you know, if you don't believe in, and it's corrupted, the word's sustainable. I mean, it's become so fashionable, it's lost meaning. Anyway, we can talk about, we can talk about relatively off the wall financial assets, and we can talk about actual alternative assets, which would be let, tangible things, I think, in general. Okay, so, so let me ask you, though, about the, the, those two classes of things, because even financial assets, which are the paper assets like stock securities, um, yeah. you know, that's, it seems to me that those are, those are really derivatives of something. They, they once were of something tangible in that it was a claim on the earnings of a company. And you know, and you 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 basically and, and companies pay dividends, and you you expected to the investment to be based upon not the the future sale of that security, but really on the the income that that company produced. But it seems to me at this point, like all, mo the most stocks, well, very few pay any dividend of any consequence at all. It's just like the banking system savings at this point. So very few pay dividends at all, and then and most and um, and they're you know, the game is really not about whether or not, you know, having a claim on the company's income. I mean, theoretically, that's still there. But, you know, you have no say over what happens with the company. The company is pursuing its own weird interests, often the ESG interests, for instance. Um, and, you know, it seems to me it's a, it resembles something a lot more like betting on horses than it does something that would have been that I would read about, you know, in, uh, in Benjamin Graham's book. Yeah, exactly. The stock market actually started out to where people that had saved some money would look at the business and decide whether they wanted to put the business, put the money into a business because it would grow and pay dividends. It doesn't work like that anymore. Now it's a question of uh, will the other fools out there pay more for the thing that I, it's all crazy. I, I really have no interest in the conventional stock market at this point. And, but while I say that, just the other day, I was speaking to a guy who was a, uh, well, actually, oddly enough, I was talking to two guys. One guy managed a fund that specialized in North Korean debt. That's wow, kind of, that's a specialty. <laughs> yeah. It was always a very small fund. 
obviously. And then there was another guy I spoke to who was in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. And we might have him here on the program to talk about his experiences in Central Asia. And uh, it's the Uzbek market is quite interesting because they, uh, they've got a, they, they elected somehow or other by accident, I'm sure, uh, a president who uh, is quite intelligent about getting rid of regulations, getting rid of taxes, uh, uh, trying to keep the currency stable, the whole thing, very unusual for- His days, his days must be numbered. I, I would think so. <laughs> but in the meantime, the Uzbek economy is booming. It actually is booming. Uh, the government continues to shed uh, parastatal corporations, which are then listed on the public markets. And average dividend yields, if you go to Uzbekistan now, are about uh, four, five, six percent. A lot of companies are seven, eight, nine percent, mm-hmm. selling at three, four, five, six, seven, eight times earnings. It's an anomaly. But in countries like that, unfortunately, when things get too good for too long, they figure, oh, well, now we can elect a socialist. That's what they always do. So it's a speculation, I fear, not a long-term investment. There are things like that out there. That would be kind of a, an alternative investment within the financial markets. Okay. So, so basically, you break it down to the financial assets and tangible assets. And tangible assets, I assume you're saying things like physical gold. Okay, yeah, uh, that would be the first thing. And physical gold should be the foundation of your financial wealth. These are gold coins that you sequester every month if possible or however often, like a squirrel saving nuts. You put them aside and you forget about them basically. And the same thing for physical silver coins. Another thing in that same class, much more volatile and quite interesting at this point. But we've talked a lot about that. And I think most of our listeners are pretty familiar with the rap on gold and silver. But how about other stuff? Like uh, collectible cars have become almost an asset class in over the last decade or two, quite frankly. And um, the the prices of these things have gone through the moon. So as a as a longtime exotic car guy myself, I keep track of the prices of these things at auctions. And uh, I'm not going to bid at auction because I, what do I need in a goddamn car for? No, I, I know. I put <laughs> in my garage, and, and the second law of thermodynamics is basically going to rot all of its rubber and electrical parts and rust and all this type of thing. And then who am I going to sell it to? Because Maybe there's not going to be a, a mania to buy these things like there is now. So, um, okay, collectible cars, great place to be. But I've said it many times before. I promise you, in ten years, most of those collectible cars will be sitting in barns with birds nesting under the hood, just like mm-hmm. happened in the 1930s with Duesenbergs and Cords and things of that nature. The hot cars so, so um, actually, I just have to tell you this thing. I, I was looking at a car yesterday in an auction, and it's not an exotic one. So it's not, I don't even know if you'll be that familiar with it, but and it's, it's, a, it's a 1987. Okay, so this is, I'm 12 at that point. So you got to, you know, when you're 12, the cars that like were exciting to you then, it's a Buick Grand National. Do you know what that is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. It is, as I recall. It was actually quite a fast car for the day. It has a, it has a, is it a turbocharged or is it a supercharged V6 engine? Uh, it's a supercharged, if I recall. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you know. But there are only fi- there are only 580 of them made, and the th- the whole story behind it was really great. So it's great for a collector's car. But they were, I'll just say they were. Uh, well, Corvette made GM shut it down because it actually destroyed the Corvette in the quarter mile. And yeah. they just couldn't have it because it destroyed their brand. This, you know, grandpa car, you know, yeah. <laughs> kicking its ass. So yeah. but it was $151,000 is what it was going for. $151,000 with five days left in the auction. Well, you know, I don't get it because it's basically just a Buick that they put a high horse power. power engine. Yeah. And, and just a supercharged V6. I'm, I'm sure it was, a, as I recall, it would have been a push rod engine anyway. So not even very Probably. exotic. 
Yeah. It's not going to handle but, break. It's not going to do anything. No, 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 but it's going for one hundred and fifty-one thousand dollars with five days left in the auction. That just shows you there's lots of money looking, going. Hey, these financial assets don't make sense. I want to go yeah. into alternative assets. They're looking for anything tangible, yeah. but they're, it's ending up in places like this. And you just got to wonder, like, is this where money sh- is? If you're trying to protect yourself, like these people probably are trying to protect themselves by owning something unique and different. Are there better places than stuff like that? Because it does seem to me that these, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I don't think that there's going to be, who's going to, who are you going to sell that thing to in another 10 years? Um, I just can't imagine that someone's going to pay $300,000 for it. Exactly. Because most of the people that are young now are not going to be car oriented. In addition to the fact that the electric vehicle thing and so forth. Now forget about it. It's way too late for cars as an asset class. You're, I think you're buying at the top and the bell's ringing for the exotic car market. So forget about that. And diamonds had their day in the sun, uh, several days in the sun over the years, usually when inflation, inflation gets high. I've never liked diamonds as an asset class because for one thing, it actually takes an expert to tell the difference between a diamond and uh, <laughs> something that's basically cut glass. Well, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Number two. Now, uh, number two, uh, there are two different methods. Maybe there are three now of creating artificial diamonds that are flawless. Yeah. So, I mean, why do you want something that costs so much more? with a flaw that's dug out of the earth when you can, if you want a diamond, it's flawless and can be created very cheaply. I don't understand it. Well, and, you, and yet you know that I bought one recently from Tiffany's for myself. So oh, it was very yeah, expensive. I, it was a beautiful, a beautiful rock. I, well, since it was from Tiffany's, I'm sure it was a real diamond. That's what I, yeah, but, but that, that's the only way you could know. That's the only way I could be sure is I had enough faith in their brand that they wouldn't corrupt it like that but you also yeah. probably pay double because of tiffany's of course and, and we all trust major corporations <laughs> we do we, and we should <laughs> so I, I forget about diamonds unless you can assess a diamond yourself but even if you can assess it what's the point yeah. uh okay forget about that then how about how about collectible coins uh, and of course, I've been a coin collector since I've been a kid. Still got all the stuff that I pulled out of circulation when mm-hmm. I was a kid. I mean, you could still pull silver coins out of circulation. And the occasion, believe it or not, Indian head penny would s- still be circulating in the 1950s when That's I was a, a kid. Yeah, it's true. So what about, what about coins? Well, you know, coins are just slugs of metal that some government has stamped some politician's picture on. on. (laughs) I don't know. Uh, And and the the fine gradations and all this type of thing. If I was going to collect coins, and I did uh, collect ancient Greek and Roman coins, because they are authentic artwork where everyone is unique. And um, they're a couple thousand years old. Okay, that makes them more interesting than recently the government slugs which but also much much probably much much less fungible though too right which makes it harder to be an no investor market. exactly right i mean once again you got to know what you're doing when you're buying them and if you're going to sell them it's going to be to a very small market of collectors so and anyway since i've been collecting ancient greek and roman coins and i'm not active in it anymore They've basically gone nowhere in price Mm. relative to other things forever. One of the reasons for that, incidentally, is that uh, even today, there are hordes of ancient coins that are discovered every year Mm. in Europe by farmers or God knows what. And the supply keeps increasing of them and nobody cares because nobody understands these things. Mm. So, okay, ancient coins. On. How about artwork, like paintings and things like that? Well, <laughs> it, it, I think it's actually shameful the kind of prices that they get for what I consider to be trash art, where yeah. somebody uh, 
what? Somebody nails a uh, banana peel. <laughs> banana, the whole banana. Yeah, exactly. And and some fool pays them, you know, six figures for it. I mean, so much modern artwork. There's no technical skill involved. There's no ideational thought. There's it's just some well promoted artist. That's crazy Everything, too. But everything is marketing now, Doug. It's all like like nobody even knows where value is anymore. And I think that's part of the problem. You know, you do see it in the in decadence in art, but but you also see it in, in stocks and, you know, if they're marketed well, then that's when they do well. I mean, everything is about like, yeah, you know, a GameStop, it's a meme stock, you know what I mean? A, a, a yeah. Doggy coin, like it's all, it's, it's not, not, nothing of it is real anymore. It doesn't seem like. Everybody's looking for, for a greater fool. I mean, I've bought a lot of artwork uh, actually over the years, but the only things that I've ever bought are things that I really liked, things that had, well, sometimes there were spur of the moment purchases that weren't so great. But, you know, I, I look for things that have technical expertise and something that really speak to me. And, but that's but not do, most. Do, do, you even, do you even see them though as an investment though, Doug? Do you see them as no. like something that you'll be able to sell for I never, later? I never thought of them as an investment at all. No, not, not at all. I thought of them as just, things that I wanted to own because they were nice to look at. And as an investment, uh, if I wanted to sell them, to whom? To whom? I mean, <laughs> yes. you know, I'd have to find a gallery that the owner of the gallery liked my taste and thought that his customers, it's crazy. I mean, and, and, these, and the things at the top end of the market are basically trading sardines is what they are. Yeah. Uh, so you're not going to hang them in your house because they're too valuable to hang in your house. So you'll steal them. So the, the, the trading sardines. I mean, look, there's every dog has its day and so forth. But uh, should isn't, isn't the whole idea of, of collector stuff being an investment alternative, isn't it in and of itself a sign of the top? Because you know, we think of investments fundamentally in businesses, you're investing in productive assets, you know, you're investing in businesses that generate cash flows or that produce or drill oil out of the ground or that produce food or something. And then the idea of these tokens, which are, you know, uh, aesthetically pleasing, I agree, and I love them, but that, the, that we're signing now these value to these non-productive tokens, it's interesting. Yeah. Technically speaking, you can't invest in things like artwork and old cars and things like that. An investment, if we're gonna define the word properly, is an allocation of capital in a place where it will create more capital. In other words, mm -hmm. you buy an ear of corn and you invest in it because when it's planted, it'll give you a field of corn. That's right. an investment. These things are speculations. And I'm afraid the people that are playing with them don't understand the difference between an investment and a speculation. And a speculation is a guess on what other people are going to like. Okay. So let's talk about real estate within that context then, because, you know, if there's one thing that most Americans are invested in, it'd be real estate. And most people, I know a lot of people that have like a, substantially improved their life because they've been in the market at the right place in the right time. And like really has given them retirement security and everything else. Um, but to me, I've always seen, Personally, I've always seen real estate as basically a, con a consumer item. That's the way I've seen it. It is. A house is a consumer item. It's like a toothbrush, which has, has a very short lifespan for a consumer item, or a car, which has a medium lifespan, and a house has a longer lifespan as a mm -hmm. consumer item. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Is that what art is, basically? Yeah, I guess it would be, wouldn't it? Art would be a consumer <laughs> item. It falls apart over time. It's subject yeah. to all kinds of things going wrong. Everything from water damage to. But you're, but but I guess I mean it because in that you're buying it for the enjoyment of your life, not for and not for the idea of producing capital in the future, right? Precisely. So that's right. Yeah. That's Which is nothing wrong with that. I mean, I'm a pro consumer. Yeah. I like the hate. You know, I mean, you know, enjoyment of your life matters. No, yeah, it's great. Sometimes you, you choose wisely and it gets older, it still survives. Other people want it for whatever reasons. No, it can work out. But it, 
then it becomes an, <clears throat> an inadvertent speculation. You know, but it's not right. So what else is there in the in the what what is there in the alternative asset category that people are not really looking at might or, be missing? Yeah. Look, I mean, what what else have I bought over the years? Because I liked it. Handmade knives. There's a mm -hmm. class of people, I don't know how many there are in the US, that you know, either for a living or for a hobby, go into their Smith shop and hammer out interesting knives, okay? Mm. Okay, so I've got a bunch of them and uh, they're fun to look at, but uh, if I wanted to sell them, is there any market? Uh, the answer is uh, basically no. Well, I, I know Van Simmons was collecting a bunch of knives for a long time, so there's a couple, there's a handful of other collectors who do it, I think, but basically, yeah, sure. you're right. yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I might buy it and then I've, then I've got, I've got another interesting knife to look at and then, you know, at some point, all the people that own these knives sell them and they hit the market. And I, will there be a mania in handmade knives? Uh, I kind of <laughs> know. <laughs> so what, what else is there? You can, you can collect books. I mean, mm -hmm. some books will go up in first editions and things like that. Yeah. But still, well, even those, I mean, we know we, we were talking about uh, friends of yours who have great libraries and you know, they pass away and their kids, you know, end up looking at it as it's, you know, it's kindling for a fire. I mean, they, they don't see any value in it. No, just paper. They, don't know who, they don't know who the authors are and they don't know how to market the books to somebody that they would have value to. And it, it's a problem. This whole thing of alternative investments, like um, you can buy, um, if your timing is right, I mean, a few years ago, if you bought, uh, well, look, just recently, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about a house in Aspen, which, as you know, I used to live in for 30 years during the northern summers anyway. And somebody bought it. It's at the base of Aspen Mountain, which incidentally is not a good place for a house, in my opinion, because there's no sun at the base of the ski mountain. Yeah, you don't want that. No, you want it on the other side of the valley because of you don't want anyway. So somebody bought this house for twenty. Let me see if I got the numbers right. But I'm pretty close. Somebody bought it for twenty three million dollars and sold it three months later to somebody for about fifty million dollars. And it's Normal. understandable. Whoever whoever it is that bought it probably made some huge score in God knows yeah. what. And. It's probably a guy in his 50s or 60s and says, hey, what's the money for? I want the house. I'll just pay whatever it takes. Okay, but this is not the time to buy real estate in Aspen, which has incidentally been very, very good to me. Um, yeah. Like that wasn't a market I wasn't in. But, but still, it's still speculation in a way. You're requiring it like, like it shouldn't, uh, shouldn't a, a true test of an alternative asset be that it's, it's strongly differentiated from the other asset classes and i think that in, in, in at least a couple of ways and one is its tangibility yeah but the other one it should be at this point that it actually pays you to own it instead oh, of it, you you pay to own it you know yeah exactly and let's and people forget about the carrying costs of these things yeah. especially real estate because you buy real estate depends on where of course but you're going to pay an annual fee to the government called real estate taxes of 1% of the value of the house per year, maybe 2% some places, outrageous, going up. going up. And then you've got maintenance. I mean, deferred maintenance, things, you know, need repainting, pipes need fixing, carpets need, re the whole thing. I mean, people forget about the maintenance costs of a house. Otherwise, it's going to look like a shithole after owning it for 20 years, unless you fix it up. And then, of course, you've got the utilities that you've got to pay and the costs of having somebody come in and clean it. If it's big enough to be an investment, it's probably big enough that you got to have somebody come in and clean it and stuff breaks. I mean, no, I, I, I don't get it. But are there other so, OK, so uh, the way I've thought about it, I guess maybe I'm asking a leading question because I'm I'm trying to justify my own investment recently in this farm and that I think that you know, I have cash, 
had cash, you know, that I, and, and that cash is losing 15% a year by my estimates of just sitting in the bank. So I either got to like somehow, actually, yes. Yeah. So I got I to gotta fight to get ahead of it or I want to, you know, but I had it in cash because it was my savings, you know, but so I didn't, I didn't want to speculate with it. And so what I've tried to do is I've looked at this buying this farm as an actual investment because I'm trying to basically buy assets that I hope will be productive that basically produce a version of cash flow, even if that cash flow is just cows, right? Um, and produce a version of cash flow every year for me that basically will survive regardless. So, but I mean, it's really hard to invest. I mean, are there things that are like that, like buying a farm that can be productive assets that can generate a, a version of cash flow that aren't, you know, that you can do without having to do the big scale of a farm? Is there anything that generates cash flow anymore? That really is a real investment in that in those terms. Well, I mean, I personally approve of buying farmland, and I can't help myself to uh, <laughs> when I'm online every day. I get a, an email from Hall and Hall, which are the biggest, at least I think, they're the biggest ranch and farm brokers in the U.S. Where they're always selling some huge piece of land for. Well, typically several million, sometimes tens of millions of dollars. So I just like to keep, keep track of what stuff is supposed to be worth various places. I kind of like that. But, you know, having bought uh, <laughs> how many square miles of land down here in, in South America, I mean, I mean, how many square miles of land did we buy down here? We say we bought 150,000 hectares, which is to say like, we bought like 350,000 acres. acres, about, yeah. and that's 640 acres per square. So we bought about, I don't know, 500 square miles of land. <laughs> and it's, it's actually insane. It and is insane. It, it was pretty cheap. We thought we'd make money, but we were wrong. Oh. Well, be right someday. I mean, but but is it be, but is it because you were trying to make money off the off the spec off the value of the land changing because of the economic environment you assume would change down here, or were you actually trying to make those were those non productive assets and turning them into productive assets to generate cash flow and then make money that way? Yeah, well, we tried both actually, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I. I partially grew up on a, on a dairy farm and, you know, thought I had absorbed some stuff <laughs> by, by osmosis, no. but not, not really. And in my mind of minds, I was thinking, you know what, we'll start out and we wound up with, at one point we had a, on this one piece of land, we had what, 1200 cows mm -hmm. and hey, figure it out. We got 1200 mama cows. And every year, they each have a baby cow. And then two years later, the baby cow has another. And I figured, this is, we're going to be like coining money. Exactly. It's like being the Fed. Right. But it's not. No. I mean, no. You know, there's a reason why they say ranchers don't make any money and farmers don't make any money, except maybe once every 10 years to keep them out of bankruptcy. We're yeah. go up or but so here's my theory on that. And you can tell me where I'm wrong because you have way more experience than I am. You know, I'm the new farmer here. So is that your the measurement is in in the cash that they make. So I look at like even things like well, as I'm really focused on Joel Saladin's regenerative ag stuff. And if you think of the soil and the farm really as a bank, you can you know, you can bank value there. You're just not turning it into, you know, cash money that you can then go use and buy Ferraris with. But like, you know, what else are you going to do with that? If you're if you are generating positive cash flow for a farm, for instance, that could turn into cows, it could also be cash money, but it could also be that the soil is actually more valuable next year than it was this year. You know what I mean? And like, yeah. I think I think the over focus on, you know, that things are going up in some dollar value is what has made investing very confused for people, you know, because they're not seeing all the other parts of it. Does that make sense at all? Yeah, it does, among other reasons, because of course the dollar is a floating abstraction, but people in their 
back of their mind is think it's somehow stable because it doesn't change in value from day to day. All of that's changing now too. Yeah. So let's see, owning a farm today. See, the problem with it is this, is that owning a farm, I think you're gonna find can be very enjoyable if you're wired the way Joel Salatin is. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's really very interesting. And to be a proper farmer, you've got to be a variety of Renaissance man. You've got to yeah. know a little about a whole bunch of different things. Okay, that's kind of interesting to keep you occupied. But do I want to do that at this point? No, I've, no. I've, become, no, I've, become, no, I've become too lazy. I mean, so the farm I got here could be productive and profitable. But I doubt if it ever will, because I've got to hire a manager and the, he's got to hire other people. And, you know, so yeah, you don't, I, you don't care enough. Of, you don't care enough about trying to make sure that it's generating cash flow for you. But I really don't. What, what I like about this farm is that I've got a big backyard where I look out. The window. <laughs> see, I don't know if you can see anything out there yes. or not. You know, yes. I can see a whole bunch of trees out there on the horizon. and a huge field with cattle lowing on it. And sometimes there's soybeans growing on it on alternate years and, and so forth. That's why I have it. It's for amusement and for privacy, not because I expect I'm gonna make any money. I mean, mm. you've got to take it seriously to make any money. And you may, yeah. but you're gonna get a fantastic, well-rounded education in doing this. and. And if the supply chain breaks down and you can't get anything, you'll actually have stuff to eat. Right. Well, and, and actually kind of uh, in, investing in things that actually cause you to get a well-rounded education could be argued as investing in an alternative asset class in general. You know what I mean? Like, it, because you, it is paying dividends in different ways. And if everything is always determined simply about whether or not it's going up in value and dollar value, then, um, you know, I think that's. I think it's. A, I think that causes distortions in the market if you're measuring everything based upon, you know, what it's fungible for today. Yeah, and and doing something on a farm, even if it's only five acres, which amounts to a large garden, it kind of keeps you grounded in reality. It's like uh, Earth, Moon, Sun, dirt, man, woman, plants. I mean, real stuff as opposed to fictitious stuff that comes over the net. Exactly. Which, you know, I, I, and of course, I don't trust anything electronic these days. My wife told me the other day that Apple is planning on not selling you any more computers, but you have to lease your computer and lease. So you don't own anything, but I'm not going to like it. <laughs> you won't be happy? You won't want nothing to be happy? <laughs> no, I mean, what if Apple decides that they don't like what I'm putting on my computer and they, they shut me down? Well, okay, I can go back to pen and paper again, but I've been spoiled. Yeah. Well, that's how, the whole system is based upon, like, it's, it's the whole system is based upon, uh, you know, my moral motivations is around monthly income and cash considerations. And and so it makes sense from Apple's perspective, you know, the subscription businesses that they're in, that's what Amazon is really all trying to be. All these businesses are really trying, I mean, hell, I, even the, you could argue, I think that like the, you know, Monsanto is in the subscription business, right? Because sure. they say, yeah. Once you, so, once you buy their modified seeds, you need to buy the Roundup and so forth. It, it, exactly. It's, so, um, it's so, so they're trying to get everybody on this constant treadmill. And as you mentioned to me before, you know, the only way that that means you have to have current money, you can't have savings and something other than the dollars, basically, because but you can't uh, save the dollars because it's they're losing value so quickly. And as we right. were talking about earlier, this is why a guaranteed annual income on the part of the government is just about a guarantee, because okay. everybody's on the payment plan for everything from their computer to their Netflix, to their car, to their house, to the furniture, right. they, everything is financed for most people. And if they can't meet the financing, then the whole system starts to collapse. Right. And well, then it's not close. So of course, yeah. they'll push. And, and, and of course they're planning on doing this now. Gasoline prices are high. 
there are a number of idiots in Congress that have come up with various plans. I'm sure Elizabeth Warren, who's famous for plans, has her plan too. <laughs> to ship everybody uh, extra money to pay for the gasoline. Not right, caused, caused, by the, caused by the extra production of money. <laughs> no, no, the situation is actually getting out of control. I mean, really it's is. the stuff that I used to write about theoretically as being inevitable years ago. But you and didn't even believe it, really? Did, did you believe it, that it would come like this? Well, I thought it's logical that it's going to happen. How could it not happen? It just took a lot longer to happen mm. than I expected. But, you know, things that take a lot longer than you expect to happen, once they get underway, generally happen much more quickly than you expect them to happen once they finally do happen. And go to extremes faster. Yeah, go to the extremes. Yeah, and I'm, I'm afraid. And one of the reasons why of all these alternative investments we've talked about, having a uh, productive plot of ground uh, away from a major city where there's no guarantee that the store shelves get filled with food or that people will have something of value given to them somehow to pay for the food. You know, I mean, this could be like a dystopian movie. movie. And, and since science fiction is, has always been a much better predictor of the future than all these think tanks in Washington, D.C. and thereabouts. Yeah, we could actually go into a, a new dark age, hopefully not one that lasts for 500 years, but a dark age that lasts for 10 years. And if it's dark enough, with everybody living in cities today and being highly urbanized and way away from producing real tangible wealth at all, you could have a lot of I mean, people are like cockroaches. They're hard to mm -hmm. kill. I mean, look, the siege of Leningrad during World War II lasted what, four years, and it was extremely hard to get any food into the city at all. And meanwhile, people were trying to kill you, but most of the people survived. So, right. But it could get really bad. It could get really bad. You know, I was just last, last question. Uh, I always, you know, was thinking about imagining our dystopian future years ago and it was always like uh, is it is it brave new world or 1984 and i imagined it was brave new world you know it would go that like and you know people would just take a you know, soma pill or whatever and you know it'd be okay uh, but it really seems like it's it really seems like it's a much more 1984 but it's actually both ah. i mean it's not either it's not it's not either or it's both is what we're getting hmm technology ends up being kind of like a soma pill in a way you know going into the metaverse instead of uh actually going on vacation entirely apart from the fact that you know how can you trust these numbers but i understand that something like a third of all the humans in the u.s are on some psychoactive drugs yeah exactly yeah. of which there yeah. are at least a hundred and some of these things are really dangerous they'll definitely screw you up and you can't get off of them. So there's there's been some articles recently I saw about that like apparently there's some company that is that markets through social media uh, ADHD medicines. So these are you know, it's speed basically, mm -hmm. and they're marketing it to people. And so they and because of the laws that were changed about telemedicine during the COVID stuff, they can basically have they have a, these are controlled substances. Okay, so in the U.S. they're controlled substances. But you can get on the phone with telemedicine and they will deliver to your house then this controlled substance wow. and it's all and it's heavily marketed and it's like a big funded you know startup company and it's just going like crazy so it actually literally is easier to get some speed delivered to your door than it is for you to get um i don't know to get well certainly to get uh psilocybin or anything like that but probably easier than you to get uh a decent job or you know anything else in the normal society and, and just so there's not con any confusion out there it's that we both approve and advocate of all drugs of everything that's the only way to solve the drug problem from yes any number of points of view it's total legalization just like you know aspirin or vitamins same thing with her heroin or fentanyl or anything Yep. And it'll teach a little bit of responsibility to people. Mm -hmm. And 
knows that it doesn't. Well, hey, I'm sorry, but maybe the gene pool needs cleansing. You're not supposed to say that, but you know, frankly, you're responsible for yourself. And if you do stupid things, you got to accept the consequences. I don't care right. if that means driving drunk uh, or we're taking too much fentanyl. That's right. I totally agree. Yeah, no, my, my criticism was definitely not of the drugs itself. It was just that the, the marketing and targeting using these uh, social media, which has already really screwed people up in many ways, I think, with these big corporations and using it to um, you know, effectively develop these really good marketing campaigns where they can seduce people you know, pretty easily because you can target marketing so well on it. But anyway, my main point is that the, uh, the numbers about people on psychoactive drugs in the US, I bet you it's way above that number. We said 30% at this point. I bet you, I wouldn't be surprised if it you know, went up 20% or 30% from where it was just during the pandemic era because of the distress people have lived under. I wouldn't doubt that because a lot of people perhaps want the drugs because they want to get out of their reality and get into a dream world. So they ask their buddy to, hey, order twice as much and yeah. sell them. Or, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think things are pretty, pretty screwed up. Pretty so screwed up. yeah, it'll be really interesting this summer in the Northern Hemisphere when inflation really comes out and uh, you know, people find that they can't afford stuff and maybe the supply chains. This is gonna be really interesting these next few years, but not entirely so, pleasant. I said that was, that was the last question I was gonna ask you, but I wanna ask you one more thing. Did you see Biden did, uh, talk about that there were going to be actual food shortages? Did you see that? This little oh, clip really, about that? How recently was this? Yesterday. Yesterday. No, I hadn't seen that yet. Now, on the one hand, if he says it, I tend it to- It might not be true. Right have a super abundance of, of food exactly but, but in this case i think he's probably i think he's probably right it's everything from fertilizer prices have about tripled of all the three major fertilizers they've all tripled and now there are shortages uh, of fertilizer because of uh because of russia farmers mm -hmm. you know don't want to speculate if it's too expensive to plant crops well maybe you maybe just set, leave the set it out yeah, sit it out. Uh, yeah, anything can happen. And, you know, the truckers are, it's expensive to ship things and the truckers are unhappy. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong. But on the other hand, people sur survive the siege of Leningrad. So we'll survive. But hey, it was pretty unpleasant in Leningrad. <laughs> yeah, I imagine it was. Well, I'll send you that clip so you can watch this, this uh, little uh, speech of Biden's because it'd be interesting to hear your feedback oh. on that next week because it's pretty it, shocking. It, it's fascinating and, and and I love listening to Biden and 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 Kamala and who's that goofball that they're going to put on the Supreme Court the one that doesn't can't define oh. what the woman is. Is it Kendi Jackson? Ken, yeah. Uh, Kendi where did Jackson, she get like that? First, where did she get that first name? Is it a made-up name? Or is it a real African name that her parents research? I don't know. Well, I mean, uh, ja well, Jackson sure, certainly isn't a real African name that her parents researched. Is, there, does she have, is her last name hyphenated or does she have two last names? I feel like I should know more about this than I do, Doug. Or something like that? Yeah, I don't know. I don't well, know. I should I'm know. I'm very suspicious of anybody that has a hyphenated last name. Mm. They're trying to signal something to you. Mm. Well, she, no, it certainly wouldn't be that she's a woman. So they're not signaling that she's a woman. She remember no, she specifically said she did, she can't determine what that is. You really need to be a biologist to know for sure. I know it, it, it's actually reached the, where a Supreme Court nominee can be. That is she stupid? No, I don't think she's stupid. I, no, I don't think so either. Of course, you've got to define the word stupid and. Uh, the, the definition I think is most appropriate most of the time isn't low IQ. It's mm -hmm. an unwitting tendency to self-destruction. And when she can get away with stuff like that, it's, it, it's a sign of mass stupidity in the mass US. Stupidity. Unwitting tendency to self-destruction. Her, her name is Ketanji Brown Jackson. So yeah, it's not hyphenated, but it is a double last name. Uh-huh, okay. Brown Jackson. All right, so her parents obviously had pretensions. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> well, she got to the, she's she's a candidate for the Supreme Court, so maybe they were right. Amazing. All right. Okay. Well, we'll yeah, leave it here, Doug. You know, next lifetime, I often said, "Yeah, I want to come back as somebody important, like an actor." No, I want to come back as <laughs> somebody important, like a black woman. No, or a or a transgender swimmer. That's even better. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll leave it there for today, Doug. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend. Thanks.